So, Ganesh, are we live? Are he live? Yes, live. I... Good. We get to restart again. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm Benedict Parmanan. Welcome to GLF Green Dialogues on World Water Day. Uh, I'm pleased to welcome Bridula Ramesh and also a warm welcome to the audience. Uh, Bridula is joining us from Madurai from her net zero waste home. One, one Bri small caveat here, Benedict. It's now okay. become almost net zero waste because earlier <laughs> we used to take waste from the corporation. They no longer okay. give us the waste because they're using it themselves. Okay. So we have a little bit of an accounting issue, which I need to sort out before the next book comes out. Cool. You tell us more about it a little later. Yeah. So Ridula is an angel investor in clean technology. She's invested in many startups as well. She teaches climate change at Great Lakes Institute in Chennai. Uh, she runs the Sundaram Climate Institute, which does research on climate change. So Mithula's first book, The Climate Solution, India's Climate Change Crisis, and what we, we can do about it was published in 2018. It demystifies climate change and offers several practical solutions on how India can tackle climate change. So we are here today to talk about Ridula's new book, Watershed, how we destroyed India's water, how we can save it. Uh, nice cover, Mridula. Thank you. I, I believe you have taken the picture yourself. No, no, not at all. Photo credit is given to you in the book? No, I don't think so. This was taken. Oh, okay. I, I mean, this is from one of those websites. I didn't take this picture myself. But we're very happy to take credit, but I can't. I didn't take it. <laughs> okay. So, yes, uh, congratulations on the book. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. And uh, all the best. I'm sure it would have sold a lot of copies. Uh, having seen you do such aggressive marketing in uh, so many forums, and I don't think you left any publication <laughs> uncovered. Everyone has covered your book and uh, good podcasts and things like that. So must have been a, a lot of hard work this year, right? It's been a hectic few months, yes. OK, so I finished your book last night. And uh, I felt as if I've become an expert in water issues on India. It really opened up my eyes on so many uh, broad, broader issues and also uh, smaller issues as well, but which are quite important. So telling the audience to pick up a copy today, okay. it's worth, not just worth, it is, it, it's going to be a reference point on anything to do with water for a long time to come. I think both her books fill a wide gap in understanding climate and water issues from Indian perspective. Uh, I think I picked up this line from your book, which is really interesting, which is, if climate change is a shark, water is its teeth. No, Benedict, that is a, that's a quote that uh, I correct, picked correct. up. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So, it, so, yeah. so you, did, you did quote somebody with that, uh, with that quote. That's where I picked up, yeah. So what I liked is that uh, your book doesn't, it's not a rant on how bad the water situation is in India and blame uh, those who keep blaming all the time. So it's it's clearly a book of promise and it's a book of hope. That's why I picked up the second part of the subtitle, how can we save it as the title of the talk today? So we focus more on the solutions uh, today because we will need the whole day if we talk about all the uh, really uh, interesting issues and also the history that you have captured in the book. So for those who have joined new, uh, for those who are new to GLF Dialogue series, a quick intro to Green Literature Festival. It's an initiative of Sustainability Next magazine that has been in circulation since 2013 with a tagline, Profit for Good. Megha Gupta, 
Pooja Bula Debrati Ghosh and I started GLF in June last year. So far, we have hosted more than 40 authors uh, as part of GLF Festival in December 2021 and five stand up standalone uh, dialogue series. So we are quite proud of having hosted so many uh, mm -hmm. environmental authors so far, Ridula. Thank you. It's, I think you fill a very important gap. I think more people, it's good if more people learn, read books and sort of, you know, start contributing to the genre by writing more. More yeah. ideas for mm -hmm. people and yeah. provide a very important service there. Yeah, that's the purpose of uh, uh, GLF itself, to essentially mainstream green literature, pull it out of the margins the way it is today, and also provide a strong platform for action-oriented dialogue. Because we usually, our dialogues are usually about cribbing and uh, uh, blaming, and very few of them are on action-oriented. And your book is thoroughly action-oriented. I think that's the best part of your book. Okay, so uh, just a couple of more uh, protocol, which is that we have uh, WWF India as our, one of our partners and your uh, uh, trustee in that I just uh, <laughs> learned. Uh, Terry India Climate Collaborative and Asley are our partners. So through these partners, we hope to uh, bring green literature out of its uh, margins to the mainstream. And of course, big thank you to the Habitats Trust. That's our principal sponsor. Okay, uh, Ritula, let's start with you telling us your experience of uh, how you set up your net zero waste home. Um, I see that there was a drought in Madurai, and then you you were on, you're the only house that uh, didn't have to. Uh, take corporation water or something like that. Um, so waste is different, water is different. So which one yeah. would you like me to talk about? Yeah. Just summarize it, the whole, the whole home part of it, net zero home. Uh, no, let's just talk about the water bit. I'll talk about waste okay. another time, perhaps. Okay, um, sure. So in water, I think we ran out of water in 2013, right? It was just after my daughter was born. And uh, our bore well ran dry, like so many bore wells are running dry across India. And I don't think if there was a realization if we didn't help ourselves, we were transporting water and uh, paying a fortune for the water because we have a, we are fortunate to have a large garden. But until we were using the bore well water, we never realized how expensive water wise it was, right? And then when it ran out, we were using these uh, tankers and tankers of water and we said, okay, we can't afford this, so what can we do? Um, and then when we asked that question, we realized we had no clue, right? And uh, we didn't know where to put our finger on. We were running around like monkeys for a little while. And then that's when I said, look, I'm trained in data management. That's what I do in the factory. So why not get data? So then we started getting meters. Now I, you know, in the book, I have a small section on meters. You have all these fancy meters, IOP, dashboard. That time we didn't have anything. So we had to do the ground research to figure out what meters would work. Then we started with one and soon we had 15 meters in one house, right? Okay. And some people say that's excessive, but I say, you know, the investment you make there will make you that much more resilient because now we know mm -hmm. exactly where we're using water, when, mm -hmm. and then we know why. And then we know how to manage it. Yeah. Right. Like, for example, let me give you an example. We get our water from the ground, uh, you know, from the bore well, and it has a very high TDS, about 1,500. So we can't, it's not portable. So we have an RO plant to sort of uh, make it portable. But the RO gives out a lot of reject water, right? Which mm -hmm. is one of the problems of RO water. So I said, okay, we can't just dump all this water, you know, we can't afford it. So what do we do? So we started saying, okay, okay, let's test the RO water and we tested it. And then we, I, I by that time made a trip to Israel also and uh, became friends with this desalination engineer. And I said, look, this is the test profile of the rejection thing. It's not that high on chlorides. It's well under thing. So can we reuse this? She said, yeah, you can go ahead and reuse it. So we did. 
And uh, you know why the meter becomes important is we put a we told the uh, person who waters the garden, please use the reject water. They didn't. Okay, they said this woman doesn't know what she's talking about, so I'll go ahead and use the you know borewell water. So then we put a meter. We have this ugly syntax tank. If you come to our house, you can see it. It's really ugly, but it's 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 the core of our resilience. So we said we put a meter on that and said, okay, I'm going to track the meter to make sure you actually use this in the garden. And then after that, we stop going out. And then every there's not a year that goes by that we don't add some bell or some whistle to our water resilience. And that's yeah. the whole point of the book. Once you start yeah. saying, look, I'm responsible for my water, what can I do about it? It becomes a journey, right? And yeah. every year you start adding, you see it in a new way. Like for instance, um, two years ago, we had tremendous rains, right? Yeah. And then we saw our water running out into the street. Our rainwater was running into the street. So we mm. built two ditches and covered it up with a grill and connected it to a rainwater harvesting system. You know, bit by bit, you just keep adding. Now we're looking uh, to see whether we can add a sewage treatment plant. I was hoping to have it done before the book, but uh, it didn't work out. But uh, that's something that I would like to do. But it's a journey. Yeah, yeah. So uh, can you take us to the big picture of why you wrote watershed One, so yeah. benedict when i wrote the, the first book was basically written because i said look we need to make climate change accessible right it seemed yeah. as an elite topic and don't yeah. forget this i started writing in 2015 right end 2014-15 mm -hmm. that time it was really seen as an elite topic so it, there was a bunch of articles in uh, the hindu which were well received and then that became the first book after that, I started becoming part of climate conversations, right? And when yeah. I became part of these climate conversations, I realized well, everybody's talking about carbon. Yeah. And I said, no one's talking about water. You almost become a bad person if you introduce water into the dialogue. So I said, why isn't anyone talking about water? Because for India, water is so important, right? It is yeah. like uh, the other analogy I use in the book is, if uh, you know, take a movie like say uh, Baji Rao Mastani. Do you remember who the lead actress is, or do you remember who the executive producer is? Yeah, the lead actress. The lead actress, right? So, um, water is the lead actress of the climate change drama. Yeah. Very right. Good. Carbon is the executive producer, but water water is the lead actress, and you know yeah. today. We've already crossed certain climate thresholds. So you yeah. need to manage water and water needs to be part of the climate conversation, which is why I wrote yeah. the second book. Yeah, brilliant. Uh, <clears throat> so let's get into uh, uh, some of the larger topics that you uh, have addressed in the book. So before that, I'd like to tell the audience that this is a, an interactive conversation. So you can post your questions on the chat uh, box that is there to your right. So we'll take up uh, questions as we go along. Yeah, so uh, Nithula, the big issue today facing India is the green, how the green revolution is more or less become a black revolution, especially in Punjab and uh, other areas of North India. So you have touched on agriculture in a big way. Uh, I mean, uh, if you were made the uh, water minister of Punjab by AAP government today, what will you do? <laughs> okay, I think there are few more unlikely possibility than my being made the irrigation minister of Punjab. Okay, so let's we just put that out there. But I think, you know, we need to sort of go back before we say, look, how can we rectify this? situation we need to really understand because if you and i go and tell people in punjab grow something else they think you're mad right um there are a section of farmers who fully understand and i've quoted some of them in my book saying look we don't eat rice here 
Yet we are growing rice and we are exporting our water out. But, you know, why did you pick perhaps the driest place in India and choose yeah. to grow this water-hungry crop, right? It's it's just sort of boggles the mind. Um, yeah. And I think for that, you need to dial back in history, right? Because uh, one of the things I look at in the book is what the Indus farmers, you know, the, mm. that the Indus overlapped some of this, the Indus Valley civilization overlapped yeah. some of this area. And I looked at what Indus farmers grew and they grew very different crops, right? So why did Punjab uh, or Haryanvi or any other, so many other Indian farmers grew these, start growing these very climate, uh, climate inappropriate crops, right? So mm. that I, I argue is because of the British. Yeah. It's primarily because the British said, look, your local water availability doesn't really matter. Our engineering can fix it, right? We'll get you the canals and we'll get you the water to your doorstep and we'll get railways to cart it out. So don't you worry about that. And they made it more attractive by making the variable tax, which was paid in kind, into a fixed cash tax. And that was the most important because look, once a tax is variable, it varies by the water across years. And one of the things you learn about India's water in the book is that it varies so much across the years, right? Yeah. It's highly yeah. variable being our more so. Yeah. So when you have a bountiful crop, you pay a higher tax because you have a good crop as yeah. a share. When you have a drought, you don't need to pay that much tax because you, you, you didn't grow that much to begin with. But the moment yeah. you have a cash tax, not only mm. do you have to pay the same amount come rain or drought, yeah. Right? You have to pay it in cash. Yeah. And the moment you have to pay in cash, you start growing crops that have a ready cash market. So yes. your millets no longer have the cash market. But yeah. sugarcane, rice, cotton, yeah. indigo, all of these have cash markets. So they become very valuable for the farmers to grow. So I think that is the first thing. So why grow climatically inappropriate crops? That's where the root lies. Then you fast forward, you come to the Green Revolution, right? What is the context of the Green Revolution? Where did it, when was it birthed? It was birthed in a drought, right? The MSP yeah. was a child of drought. It, you know, it was a yeah. birth in a time when India was food insecure. We had back to back droughts in the mid 60s, and yeah. India literally had to go begging, saying, yeah. Can you please give us wheat to America, yeah. right? Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, one journalist called it living ship to mouth. Yeah. Right? We were like frantic. Yeah. So we yeah. were we were so hungry that we were willing to take, you know, say, look, we want this. We want this technology which will help us become food secure. And it worked. Right. And I think we yeah. owe those farmers a debt of gratitude because we yes. are food secure and that's a big deal. Right? We're yeah. sitting in the comfort of that and discussing it. So I think that's important yeah. to keep in mind. Yeah. Yeah. However. However, right? How did we get the farmers to bite? Right? We got them crop the seed varieties, which you know, if given plentiful water, would give you more yield. We encouraged mm -hmm. the use of water by making you know tariffs flat, then cheapening the tariff, and then waving it all together. So there was no controls put on water use at all. Yeah. Now, right? And then uh, yield started to stagnate. Today, you know, Punjab is the shining symbol of Indian agriculture. But Punjab's yeah. yields are so much lower than that of China's. Yeah, right? it is. And our MSP, MSP is a tool born in a drought to encourage a particular production. But the way yeah. we are implementing it today sort of mutes the incentive for any further improvement or for that matter change. Okay, so the solution is... Uh... Uh, reform in the uh, uh, MSP. I mean, the government has withdrawn under huge controversy. I, I think the farm saga. I've always been, you know, told that how come you don't focus on policy? Okay, I don't focus on policy because it you're not going to get what you need. And I think the farm law saga has shown us very clearly that you know uh, it's not electorally salient to build those kinds of resilience building policies, which is why I say, you know, you take decentralized actions mm -hmm. and you move it that way. Like, uh, you know, you want farmers to conserve water. It uh, it hasn't worked through policy. And I think it will be a brave man or woman who says, I will charge for electricity. 
in Punjab or any of the other states. I mean, it's uh, sort of the unbearable cap. How, you know, but the way I look at it is, uh, I've just invested in a startup and I wrote the book, I wrote about it, but then after that, I invested in it. This startup is working with farmers in Punjab and other states, uh, together with NGOs, I like that model, when they work together. Okay. And getting them to save water, right? Uh, it's mm -hmm. 3,000 farmers, it's not a small number. And mm -hmm. they get them to save water because they put these instruments, they handle them and say, this is what you can do. And the carrot that they provide us, look, I'll give you a sustainable tag which will allow you to export this produce at a higher price. Okay. Okay, so That's it's a carrot um, uh, sort of hand holding, which I think will work. That's really interesting. So, which are the startups that uh, you are supporting, and you think startups are a solution to India's water problem? Well, let me just say there is, uh, I, I use this in the book, I don't think there is one silver bullet for solving okay. India's problems, but I think there are many, there's a quiver full of silver arrows, and I think startups are an important area uh, which can bring about change in different types of water. I think we have not leveraged the startup opportunity like, say, Singapore has or Israel has. Um, and I've gone into why in the book. But I think it's a it's a fantastic, uh, it's a powerful tool, right? Um, so there are startups, uh, you know, minimizing waste in agriculture. One of the ones I've talked about is called Shrivan, which works mm -hmm. with mangoes and brings down waste I think, from 30% to 5%. And increases power incomes while doing it. So, you know, I, I just find it's it's a it's a I call them my vaccinations of hope. It's really okay. it's a really grim topic. So when I yeah, just yeah. this afternoon I was talking to a young man, I've been talking to him over the years, and I really like, you know, I was telling my husband also, I really like the way he's at it. Just mm -hmm. at it, trying to create a technology. This man is creating air water from air. He's there okay. all my years. So it's really cool. You know, uh, I really yeah. think uh, there are lots of young men and women, older young, uh, older men and women, all ages. You see them, and okay. really heroes. Okay, so we move to the next important, uh, uh, really change. You think uh, can be brought by uh, changing a pricing uh, model, and uh, <clears throat> we, uh, I mean, the one successful. Nearly, I mean, not completely, but uh, partially successful model is the Kejriwal model of uh, giving uh, 20,000 liters free for the uh, low income families and then charging the rest, of course, by uh, installing meters extensively. You think that is one of the solutions which. Uh, you told me you read the whole book. That case study is there. It's not fully successful. And I'll tell you why. And it, and it goes to a very important point about water policy. So what Kejriwal did, and I think just for people who don't know about it, just spend a minute explaining it. He said, look, uh, a lot of people can, um, a lot of people, um, I, you know, I will give you 20,000 liters free per month for a family uh, yeah. flat. And then what I can, what I will do is you have, you will get it free only if you put a meter, right? Even if you use more than one liter above 20,000, you'll have to pay for the whole amount. Yeah, yeah, I saw that, yeah. And his way of doing it was to say, look, he encouraged meters. But the problem, yeah. if you, and this I actually took out of the book, the metering in Delhi was already going up and all he did was to accelerate it at yeah. a cost of providing these meters. But when push came to elections, mm -hmm. he waved off all charges. Okay. <laughs> right. So, is it management or is it revealing, you know, the electoral pressures of water? Um, I think the problem is when that's why for me policy is such a difficult uh, lever to crack. I mean, I've heard a lot of people, very learned people, say, like, you know, that policy should do that, the government should do that. We elect the government, right? And we have said that we we value other things, but not water management. And I've gone into different case studies from Gujarat to Madhya Pradesh, yeah. Telangana to a tiny village where management appears to have worked um, electorally. But by and large, 
water management, right? Not water provision, but water yeah. management is not electorally very powerful, right? So what we hope, that, what we hope then? What we hope then now? If we say it, uh, we can't believe we are trust policy, then reforms are not happening. So, so what is the way? Bank policy, right? We want a hero to save us. I think, uh, and that's why I put in the uh, introduction that at the at the same time that realization that there is no outside hero to save us is both depressing and incredibly empowering. Because then you yeah. say, look, it's my problem. If I want to solve it, I have to solve it. Yes. And the moment you say I have to solve it, and the I can be like an individual. It can be a startup, it can be a company, it can be a community which a civil society gets together. And those are the stories in the book, right? I mean, nearly half the book is solutions. Each of yeah. those people have had that realization, right? It's my problem, I'll solve it. And they've gone ahead and solved it. I mean, look at Rajendra Singh's uh, actions. He's brought back 12 rivers to life. I saw it. That's a very interesting part in the book. That's a very interesting so, part in the book. Yeah, that I think, you know, and... I've talked about him in both books, but in this book, I've gone a lot deeper because I think, you know, he, he really goes, one thing that I think his example shows is you don't come with outside ideas and say, this is what works. You go there and you figure out what works and involve other people in the solution. And I think that's what um, really does the trick. I think it's incredibly empowering once you realize, you know, water is my problem and I have to solve it. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a central thread in the book as well, that uh, you take responsibility for water. So uh, I think you gave examples of many uh, in different cities, including Bangalore, how uh, people have solved their own local, how communities have solved. Uh, Do you think it is a community-led solution that is going to solve India's water problem rather than waiting for... Again, I won't say one size fit all, but I'm definitely veering towards, they tend to be more sticky. I think as the examples mm -hmm. are given in Bangalore, they tend to be more sticky. Mm -hmm. uh, but the community is involved. Um, the tank ecosystems that we studied in Madurai, we found yeah. one of the best indicators of what keeps tanks or lakes secure is if the community is actually vested in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think um, uh, getting the community involved is a good way of keeping whatever solution you come up with mm -hmm. uh, to last. So there's a question I'd like to read out, Prithula, uh, if you can you see, go to the comments and. Uh, um, so do you want me to read it out or? No, I can, I can, I mean, if you can read it, you can ans answer it by you. Sure. So you asked me uh, both climate solution and watershed are remarkably accessible books. Thank you. How easy is it to deconstruct the complexity? Have you ever struggled? Yes, of course I've struggled. <laughs> It's, it's, it is hard uh, to sort of, you know, the uh, writing the monsoon chapter and my editor and I, sort of my editor was the publisher also, we struggled back and forth because it is a complex chapter because the monsoon is a complex science. But if you don't understand the monsoon, you're not going to understand why India's water is so different from every other water in the world. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So getting that in the front was very important. And I can tell you, I really struggled with that chapter. It's very easy to write like, you know, the fluffy stuff, but um, mm -hmm. this kind of a chapter took both understanding and then just breaking it down into smaller and smaller bits. So it took a lot of revisions, mm -hmm. had a lot of people from non-science backgrounds read it also and mm -hmm. really gave me feedback on where they didn't understand it. Right? Yeah, it is quite accessible, uh, uh, the whole book. It's, it's easy. Uh, I mean, it's quite accessible, I must say. Yeah, so that the teaching actually helps. Um, mm -hmm. So, okay. you know, you, you teach, you sort of break it down. Um, and getting non science readers to read it also helps. So, do you think, do you have hope that uh, books, good books like yours, will, uh, will influence change? <laughs> well, my family used to think it was a midlife crisis gone badly wrong. Uh, I'm hoping. Okay. I won't say yes, it has or no, it hasn't. I'm just hoping it it brings about some change. Do you have an example? Sorry, sorry, finish completed. No, no, please go ahead. 
So do you have examples of some really good climate change environment books that have changed the way uh, uh, policies are made or impacted uh, uh, change? No, I, the one book I've heard about uh, really changing a lot of people is The Silent Spring, right? Which mm, just yeah, yeah. brought that environmental consciousness uh, uh, to the world. But I've heard criticism on it as well because it sort of said made DDT the devil. And when yeah. pediatricians talk about it, they said, mm -hmm. you know, DDT is not that harmful, but it's unleashed mosquitoes, which has brought mm -hmm. on the dengue epidemic. So, mm -hmm. you know, probably that book has changed it, but, you know, we have to understand change has various lenses to it. It's mm -hmm. always been as losers. So, what's your view of some of the new books that are on uh, environment, like uh, derangement and things like that? Um... I think, you know, what again and again, what I would like to say is, I don't think there's one point of view which is appropriate for every situation, right? I think the more voices that come in, uh, I always think a symphony is nicer than a solo violin. Yeah. And a harmony is better than a single voice. So I think it's important mm -hmm. to get different voices into the debate. They can violently disagree with each other, but yeah. uh, it's good makes for a richer melody, a lot of richer yeah, melody, yeah. richer yeah. music experience. Yeah. So request the audience to post your questions. We'll take it as we uh, move on. Uh, the next one, I think uh, this is a very interesting part of your book, uh, <clears throat> which is you say that uh, water is a positive multiplier. And uh, India is struggling with so many very fundamental issues like malnutrition, poor uh, primary education, primary health, all these. So you show that how managing water, even at a community level, influences all the other uh, factors. Can you take us through that a bit? So um, I wrote in the book and I recently wrote another article as well. It says, you know, mm -hmm. India's uh, female employment uh, mm -hmm. participation, female labor force participation is one of the lowest in the world. Urban Indian women work less than Saudi Arabian women. Okay. So Is it's like really ridiculous. And you know, one explanation, there are many explanations, cultural security, all of that. But one explanation is they're just tired, you know, in gathering water, right? There's there's an example I talk of in Maharashtra where women rappel down a yeah. well, okay, wait for the water to ooze out and then gather mm -hmm. it and then climb back up. Right? And mm -hmm. you're not going to be in peak form to go to a job if you're doing that every day. Yeah. yeah. Right? And carrying this, uh, you know, this 20 kilo pot uh, back and forth for nearly mm -hmm. a kilometer. Right? So I think once you fix that, and the example I give again is the, the Rajendra Singh story when yeah. he, you know, when the community worked together and brought water back, um, you know, the marriage age of Girls went up by five years. They started going back Eight. to school. Boys from 18, could get... to from 18 to 23, you mentioned. Yeah, exactly. And boys, you know, the village used to say earlier, nobody used to give us girls. Now they're yeah. actually willing, in, uh, you know, we're getting brides to come to the mm -hmm. village because we have water. So I think it's it really, it's the unspoken foundation of all of our lives. No? Unacknowledged also. Yeah. So... I mean, one of the beautiful part or the brilliant part of your book is that how you nicely blend the past, the present and the possible future. Uh, what do you hope to achieve by showcasing such uh, beautiful stories of India's association or the relationship with water? Sorry, I didn't, I didn't get that. Okay. <clears throat> Yeah, so I said that you blend India's relationship with water, the past, the present, and the possible future. So what made you focus so much on India's past and how well they've managed uh, water uh, in the past? So just to give a historical context. So, No, I think we need to really understand why we are the way we are, right? Uh, if we don't, any change we're going to make is very superficial, right? Why, uh, why do we so emotionally believe that water shouldn't have a price? 
when for most of Indian history, we, we've paid a price for water. We've paid a price in kind, which varied by geography, which varied by season, which was progressive, so the wealthy paid more. But we've come to a place where the wealthy, if anything, pay less. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, why have we come here? How have we come here? Because unless you understand that, I don't think any change is going to be lasting. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is how we work in our factory also. When we want to change something, mm -hmm. we understand why it is before we change something. And that's how we find it to be effective. So for me, the question yeah. of why are we this way is mm -hmm. very important to making any change. And the future is, there is, I think you're referring to that uh, scenario analysis in the, you know, that fictional yeah, yeah. chapter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's a very plausible future, Benedict. I think mm -hmm. it is very, very likely to happen, right? We are looking at, you know, we've just come out of a pandemic. But yeah. The next pandemic could be lurking in our water, right? And we've exhausted oh, wow. our antibiotic uh, mm -hmm. arsenal. So mm -hmm. if you have dirty water and, you know, the, I just go into how that could happen. Um, mm -hmm. You could have like the next pandemic emerge from there, as it has in the past, and yeah. it could wipe out millions. Yeah, yeah. So just today there was a uh, was it a UNDP report saying that uh, how ten of our Indian cities are the uh, worst among the for air pollution. So are they similar uh, ranking of our on rivers and water global ranking of how dirty Indian I water? I haven't is? seen that, uh, but. I, you know, one of the studies I note in my book is the, uh, you know, the Bureau of Indian Standards tested water samples across different state capitals. I think pretty much everyone failed except Bombay. And, you know, I was talking about my experience in Dharavi and how some of the water initially so polluted. So, you know, Bombay passed, but clearly the sampling wasn't universal. So um, that's the one thing I've used in the book. But India's water is, uh, you know, the drinking water is not... It varies a lot again, like everything in India's water, but uh, it could be far better than it is. Okay, so we have <clears throat> five more minutes. Uh, which which topic you think are left, but which needs to be addressed? I leave it to you. Um, we can talk about. Um, I think the, the uh, I'm quite excited about this uh, uh, thing about linking waters and how. Uh, environmentally dangerous it is, linking rivers rather. Uh, what is your view on that? So I will say that as a person living in Madurai, we are the beneficiaries of a river linking project, the Periyar with the Baigai, which happened, okay. you know, uh, 140 years ago. Okay. Um, so it has benefits, but the issue is it like any form of redistribution, it has mm -hmm. problems also. And I'll just say one and stop there. Um, I think the donor country, state, you're sitting in Karnataka, mm -hmm. I'm yeah. sitting in Tamil Nadu. So yeah. the Kaveri water is uh, is there, yeah. you know, we share yeah. it. Yeah. I think the donor upstream neighbor will, in a river in interlinking project, will always share the water when the waters mm -hmm. are plentiful. And the recipient yeah. doesn't eat it, right? True. And yeah. during the summer, when we desperately want it, the waters won't be shared mm. so mm. freely. So I think yeah. that's, yeah. A, that's a practical issue with river interlinking. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we have a question from uh, Aishwarya. Uh, do you think our literary and cultural imagination pertaining to water has any effect when it comes to pursuing actions related to water management? I think a quick one. I th this question can take. Uh, when I mean, you can go on, uh, I think I think it's 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 useful. Let me put it this way, right? I'm, I'm just going to flip this. I'm going to focus on the word local, and yeah. I think um, when you teach water or you teach anything, using local examples is incredibly effective in getting yeah. the message out to people, right? Um, yeah. I think our ancestors did it right because you know every river, every little stream had a relationship to the Ganga. So yeah. Madurai, we call it the Shiva Ganga because Shiva gave us the water, right? And okay. Madras has the Kuam, and the Kuam mm. is supposed to wash away sins which even the Ganga can't wash away. So nobody refers mm -hmm. to the Ganga. They make their own river quite <laughs> uh, special. And I think 
again going to local traditions eat your local food celebrate yeah. your local functions right i mean yeah. that itself will do wonders for your uh, the you know the what crops are grown everybody eats rice right everybody yeah. eats wheat you know mm-hmm. why not just celebrate local cuisine which se- yeah. which will you know sort of rear just our palates to uh, what on on folklore and stuff there's a lot of stories i've told in the books because i think a lot of earlier respect for water was brought out through these stories i've told a sh- the story of the shiva in adrai mm-hmm. that he was back to the stick because he slept off in building a bunt so you know it was like even a god had to sort of you know follow water rules and he would get punished if you were it so i think it's it's really an important point and i think it's an under used under used weapon okay so what's a, what are what new book are you working on sorry i'm just I as I was telling you when it is before we started the three parts of my life were all springing up in a book bag so right now my daughter is told me if i write another book she'll kill me but uh, uh yeah i th- i think um, i just keep writing what i write and right now i'm just i'm thinking about carbon a little more mm-hmm. than water uh, but okay it's... okay so a uh, good time to sum up our conversation any last thoughts No I think if we can just look at water as something local that we manage and ask yourself where that glass of water that you have in front of you came from. Wow. It could be okay. a better place. That's that's a really nice uh, last message. So uh what I had taken away from your book is the uh, uh the power of change is in our hands and uh, especially in India don't expect others to solve your problems i think own your problems and own your solutions so thank you so much ritula for your time and uh, thanks to the audience for the questions hope to see you at another glf dialogue soon thank you thank you for having me thank you